Welcome to the third and final episode in a Legendarium series about Queen Elizabeth's conquest of Ireland. In part three, Flight of the Earls, we will talk about how Queen Elizabeth won the Irish War by sheer ruthlessness. By 1598, Irish rebel Hugh O'Neill grew so bold as to demand that the English evacuate the city of Dublin, which they ruled for 400 years. Some in England grew so disillusioned with the Irish War that they considered accepting. However, Ireland had become more important to the English. With trade opening up with the Americas, Irish rebels could pirate any shipping to England from the Caribbean. Worse still, Elizabeth could not tolerate a Spanish presence just across the Irish Sea. So Queen Elizabeth sent an army under Sir Henry Bagenal. On August 14, 1598, O'Neill's army wiped out Bagenal's army at Yellow Ford and killed Bagenal himself. This became the worst defeat ever suffered by the English in Ireland. Had O'Neill marched on Dublin after Yellow Ford, he could have driven the English into the sea. Any further attempt to retake Ireland would have to start on the western coast of England. Instead, O'Neill extended his control into Ireland's Midlands before he entered Munster. Hugh O'Neill's faith and fatherland nationalism attracted much support from Irish Catholics, but won over few of the old English who lived in and around Dublin. Nonetheless, O'Neill had assembled a modern army, more than capable of matching Elizabeth's army in the field. Yet Queen Elizabeth would not give up. She sent the largest English army ever to set foot in Ireland, led by Robert Devereux, the Earl of Wessex. Though Elizabeth ordered him to seek battle with O'Neill, Devereux failed to do so, simply marching his 17,000 men around the Midlands for months. Finally, Devereux offered to negotiate with O'Neill in person. Having fooled the English as a garrison commander in Dublin and again with the O'Donnell clan, Hugh O'Neill easily tricked Devereux at the negotiating table. He convinced him to accept a peace so favorable to the Irish that Queen Elizabeth put him on trial for treason during September 1599. By 1601, Devereux made a one-way trip to the chopping block where the executioner helped him lose 10 pounds from the neck up. With Ireland almost to himself, O'Neill sought to win over the remaining towns by appealing to the locals as fellow Catholics. O'Neill knew full well that the Irish saw the English as foreign occupiers. In a proclamation, he declared, I will now employ myself to the utmost of my power in their defense and for the extirpation of heresy, the planting of the Catholic religion, the delivery of our country from infinite murders, wicked and detestable policies by which this kingdom was hitherto governed nourished in obscurity and ignorance, maintained in barbarity and incivility, and consequently of infinite evils, which are too lamentable to be rehearsed. This proclamation flew in the face of English claims that the Irish were nothing but barbarians. O'Neill followed up his speech with a proclamation of 22 articles that would have made Ireland a self-governing Catholic country under nominal English sovereignty. However, Sir Robert Cecil, Elizabeth's Secretary of State, dismissed this proclamation as utopian madness. More dangerous for O'Neill, the proclamation failed to trigger an uprising among the townspeople of Ulster or Dublin. With this first gambit of failure, O'Neill asked Pope Clement VIII to excommunicate any Irish Catholic who failed to take up arms against Queen Elizabeth. While the Pope did not go that far, he did appoint O'Neill Captain General of the Catholic Army in Ireland. 
Yet this slight delay gave Queen Elizabeth enough time to recover. With Elizabeth facing bankruptcy, harp groats reappeared to pay the army, and Queen Elizabeth eventually committed 19% of her available military manpower to the war effort. The Irish War eventually cost Elizabeth a staggering two million pounds. She also sent a more capable commander named Lord Mountjoy. Mountjoy knew that the Irish War could only be won with utter ruthlessness. He fought a year-round war, a shocking change to an island accustomed to only summer campaigns. Mountjoy used scorched-earth tactics to keep O'Neill from resupplying his army. English troops burned crops and threw iron firebrands into houses. They slaughtered cows and sheep in appalling numbers until they lay strewn about the villages. Peasant farmers scattered into the woods where they tried to survive on bark, nuts, and moss as winter neared. With his army starving and his country burning, O'Neill turned his eyes towards Spain once more for deliverance. Without an army, his hold on Ireland would slip away fast. One can only imagine the rejoicing in the O'Neill camp when word came that the Spanish landed in County Cork. O'Neill hurried towards the coast, crossing the length of Ireland in doing so. To his horror, he found only a few bands of hungry and ill-trained mercenaries. With no choice, he took the paltry offerings and hurried to Kinsale on Christmas Eve 1601. There, the Irish suffered a devastating defeat at the hands of Elizabethan forces. O'Neill is said to have lamented, Today, this kingdom is lost. Yet O'Neill must have had a passion for lost causes because he chose to become a fugitive rather than surrender. Over the next 15 months, the O'Neill army grew more ragged and hungrier with each passing season. At last, he surrendered to Mountjoy at Mellifont in 1603, unaware that Elizabeth had died the previous week. Queen Elizabeth's last days did not pass peacefully. She had to cover her withered skin with pancake makeup. Her teeth turned black because of her fondness for sugared plums. From time to time, she started raving about conspiracies which sought to raise mobs against her, and her advisors had to confine her to quarters until she calmed down. By the time that Elizabeth died in 1603, she made herself not only Queen of England and Wales, but Ireland. Her signet ring remained on her finger so long that it had to be filed off after her death. Yet this came as little comfort to O'Neill. Though O'Neill received a pardon, he could not reconcile himself to rule by the Protestant English. In 1607, he and the other Ulster lords left Ireland in what became known as the Flight of the Earls. By then, the war had ended between Spain and England, so Madrid no longer had any use for O'Neill. The man who nearly freed Ireland from English rule died a penniless exile in Rome in 1616, 13 years after Elizabeth and hundreds of miles from his homeland. And sadly, most of the Irish did not have the means to flee overseas as the Earls did, but had to live in a country ruled by foreigners. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed this series. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.